Hello, everyone. We're going to try to find the roots of this fun-looking cubic function. And when I say roots, of course, I can call that so many things. What else can we call those roots? Yes, zeros, solutions. Uh, some of you may have said x-intercepts, but these roots maybe are x-intercepts, maybe they're not. Because we're going to solve this over the set of complex numbers, okay? Find all the roots of that. We're going to say the roots can be real roots. If they are imaginary roots, we want to find those. So let's just find all of the x values that will make this equal to 0. That's basically what I'm asking. Find all x values, real, imaginary, that will satisfy this equation. So let's go ahead and do that. Now, before I start, I kind of want to get a sense of what I'm looking for. I, I like looking at a function and thinking about what that might look like graphically. So let's just think about f of x quickly. I know it's a cubic, and the leading coefficient is positive, so I know my end behavior is going to go like this. Fundamental theorem of calculus says this has precisely three roots. They might not all be real. They might not all be different roots, but I know that this polynomial has three roots. And you know, since it's written in this form, I even know it's basically started as a power function that was shifted five to the left, dilated by a factor of two, so all the y's were doubled, and then scooted up 16. So it's going to look something like that. So, you see why this is useful. Sketching it now, I see, oh, well, it d definitely has one real root. But that looks like just a single root there. And the rest of the curve is funky. So I'm thinking the other two must be imaginary roots. And I know some people like saying, oh, well, there are two imaginary roots over here. Well, imaginary roots don't appear spatially on an xy Cartesian plane. So the imaginary roots aren't going to be anywhere physically on the graph, but I know that there are going to be two imaginary roots. So this is going to be a little tricky. So knowing that, let's at least try to find the real root. All right, I'm looking at this, and again, because it's in this form, I'm inclined just to try to peel things away and solve for x. So I'm going to peel away that 16, just like peeling away the layers of an onion. I'm going to peel away that 2. Now to get that x isolated, I have to peel away the cube. I can do that by cube rooting each side, which is the same as raising each side to the 1 third. Right? That undoes that. And if you prefer to think of it as the cubed root of negative 8, you can. Of course, the cube root of negative 8 exists in the real numbers. It's negative 2, because negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2 is negative 8. And again, isolating my x, and I'm getting a little too low here. So let's bring this up here. So I have negative 2 equals x minus 5. If I just add 5 to both sides, I get x equals 3 as my real root. Can you see all of that? Kind of. OK, good. <laughs> all right, so I just found my real root. My real root is 3. So let's jot that down. My real root is x equals 3. And that kind of matches the sketch I made, right? So here was my sketch. Sure, that could happen at x equals 3. So now the question is, how do I find the other roots? I know from my sketch that they're imaginary. And gosh, I'm a little stuck as to what to do here. I have a couple of options, but you know what I think I might do? 
I think I might expand this out. Now, we know how to expand binomials. We talked about using Pascal's triangle to find the coefficients. We found this cool pattern. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to expand this out and see if that helps me at all. So let's hold on to that too. So that's going to be x to the third plus, let's do a quick Pascal's triangle. I'm degree of this polynomial is 3, so I'm going to use my row that has a 3 in it for my coefficients, so it's going to be 3x squared times negative 5 to the 1th, okay, plus 3x, my powers of x are going down, times negative 5 squared, and finally negative 5 cubed, and don't forget that plus 16, that's so easy to forget, okay? All right, so let's see, what does this give me? This gives me 2x cubed, I'm distributing the 2, negative 5 times 3, negative 15 times 2, ooh, a negative 30x squared. That's going to be 25 times 3 is 75 times 2, 150x, negative 125, times 2 is going to be negative 250 plus 16. I sure hope I did that right. Hmm. Okay, so my function in standard form is going to be 2x cubed minus 30x squared plus 150x minus, let's see, that's going to be 234. Okay, I don't have Mr. Haas here to help me and check. Let's hope I did that right. <laughs> so this is the standard form. I just rewrote my function by expanding out that binomial and combining like terms and cleaning up each term. Now why in the heck did I do that, you ask? Well, I did that because I couldn't figure out a way to find my imaginary roots when it was in that form. But I think, now if I set this equal to zero and think to myself, hmm, could I factor this somehow? And right when I say factor, I think, wait a minute, I know that I have a root of x equals 3. That means there has to be a factor of x minus 3 that would factor, be a factor of that crazy cubic polynomial. Do you see why that is? If I have a factor of x minus 3, then that's going to give me a solution of x equals 3. So at least now I have a factor. So how can I find the remaining factor? One cool strategy is to use polynomial long division. Should we give it a whirl? All right. If I know one factor, I can divide this polynomial by x minus 3. That should give me my other factor. Let's give it a whirl. Here we go. I need to erase and make room for this endeavor. So I'm doing polynomial long division. And whenever you do this, you really just have to take the time to make sure you're not making any mistakes. All right. And again, I'm doing polynomial long division so that I can find the other factor of my function. OK, so x times something equals 2x cubed. That something is going to be 2x squared. 2x squared times x is 2x cubed. 2x squared times negative 3 is negative 6x squared. And I'm going to subtract everything. That goes away. Negative 30x squared minus a negative 6. That's going to be negative 24x squared. And I'm just going to bring everything down, just so I don't forget anything. I do the process again. x times what 
is negative 24x squared. A negative 24x is going to do the trick. Negative 24x now times x is negative 24x squared. Negative 24x times negative 3 is positive. Let's see, that's 1272x. Boink. And I'm going to subtract. This goes away. 150 minus 72, I think is 78x. Bring down your next thing. Start again. x times what is 78x? That's going to be plus 78. 78 times x is 78x. 78 times 3 is, let's see, 21, 22, 23. Oh. I'm so glad this is working because, of course, I have to get a zero there. If I get a remainder other than zero, what does that mean? Yeah, it means I made a mistake <laughs> because I'm pretty sure x minus 3 is a factor, which means I have to get a remainder of zero. So if you don't get a remainder of zero, you probably dropped a negative somewhere. All right, so I was successful. So what that means now is that f of x consists of these two factors, x minus 3 and 2x squared minus 24x plus 78. And can you see that? Not really. All right, so let me erase and rewrite that. So we have room. Gosh, this is a long problem. So my function rewritten in its at least somewhat factored form is that. Okay, so I can keep factoring, I think. Uh, don't you see a 2 that we can pull out? Sure. Let's pull out a 2 there. So that leaves me with x squared minus 12x plus uh, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39. That 2 seems funny there. I think I'll just pull it out front, that commutative property of multiplication. And keep in mind now I'm finding roots. So that 2, of course, was just that 2 that stretched, whoops, that stretched everything. That's not going to affect the roots. This, of course, is my root of 3, which I already knew about. So now all I have to do is solve for x here. Now, I know it's not going to be factorable because I already know my other two roots were imaginary. So I have a couple options. I could complete the square, which actually would be pretty nice for this one. Or we could use the quadratic formula. Let's just use the quadratic formula because we like that. Any excuse to sing is good by me. So here we go x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. There's my quadratic formula. So let's see, I'm going to get 12 plus or minus the square root of 144, 39 times 4. I'm not too proud to do some little multiplication. 12, 13, 14, 15. Ah, we can see the imaginary root is creeping in. 144 minus 156 is going to give me negative 12, I think. Ooh, cool. All right, what's not cool is that I'm running out of room. So where can I bring this? Are we going to see this over here? Okay, so I'm going to scoot this up here. So I have x equals... 12 plus or minus square root of negative 12 over 2. All right. I think I can simplify that a little more. Sure. Let's see. What are factors of negative 12 that might have a perfect square? Oh, well, 4 has a perfect square. That's a factor of negative 12. Square root of negative 1 is defined to equal 
i, and that leaves me with a square root of 3. Oh my gosh, this is just getting insane. Okay, we're just erasing all of this. You can go backwards if you need to. So I have x equals 12 plus or minus the square root of 4 times the square root of negative 1 times the square root of 3 all over 2. That gives me 12 plus or minus 2i square root of 3 over 2. And if I just divide very quickly here each term by 2, that's going to give me 6 plus or minus i times the square root of 3. And ladies and gentlemen, we have done it. We have found our three roots. x equals 3 was our real root, and our two imaginary roots are 6 plus i times the square root of 3, and 6 minus i times the square root of 3. So we have found the three roots, and sure enough, one is real, and two are imaginary. That was a fun problem. I hope you found it as fun as I did.